I have a litho stone here that is ready to be etched. Uh, I just finished the drawing and I kind of rushed through it a little bit so it's not quite as detailed as I'd like it to be, but I've got to get some other stuff done. So I'm gonna move on from this image. Um, we're gonna do our first etch, okay? Uh, the first etch on a stone is uh, basically like we have a, a, a stone that has a drawing on it I use mostly crayon, but there's some rubbing crayon as well as tush wash in there. Uh, but most of it's, and lots of scraping. Um, most of the tush wash is gone now, but it's it's a little bit overworked, I would say. So, you know, it's lost a lot of that early quality that I like to, to keep if I can. And I just kind of overworked it and it is what it is now. But uh, I do want to etch this. So, uh, the whole point of doing an etch is to establish fatty acid deposits in our limestone. So the, the limestone is very sensitive to grease. It's accepting of grease and uh, in the, it's, it's a porous material. And we're going to create an etch with gum arabic and nitric acid. And the gum arabic is going to create an aqueous solution, so it's water loving. And that will go in all of these non-image areas and make it so that it's very stable. And the non-image areas will be water loving. And so when I'm printing this, I'm gonna have to keep my stone wet. And um, this will help to maintain uh, that water loving aspect of the stone. In the greasy drawing areas, I need to use the nitric acid in combination with the gum arabic so that the, the nitric acid can create fatty acid deposits. So it's basically going to release the grease from my drawing material and allow it to adhere into the porous pores of the stone and so that way when I'm uh, printing my image the I would sponge this and have a roller with oil-based inks and the roller when I sponge this the non-image areas will stay wet and they will reject the oil of the inks but wherever I have greasy drawing material will accept the ink so then I can pull impressions off of it. So it really has to do with this water loving, hydrophilic, hydrophobic relationship between oil and water. And so we're gonna kind of utilize that to the best. Uh, and then in the non-image areas, it's what we would call it a, an adsorbed gum layer where the gum arabic is going to create a very stable and hard uh, uh, non-image area and in the greasy areas we're going to create oleomanganate of lime so it's going to uh, be very uh, uh, oil loving okay so we could get into more of the specifics with that and there's a lot of literature on Moodle for that so some of the chemistry behind it um, you know the the uh, you know more technical aspects of it are are easily available. Um, also the Tamarin Book of Lithography is kind of the, the litho bible. I would check that out um, if you're interested in more of that kind of specific stuff. Um, not that I'm not, but I just want to keep this video kind of short. The um, Okay, so one of the first things that I need to do is just kind of figure out what my etch strengths are gonna be. So essentially what we have is like where my drawing material is the lightest, there's less grease in those areas, and so I'm gonna wanna etch it with a more delicate or weaker etch solution. Where my drawing material is heavy and darker areas, and there's more grease content, I would want to use a stronger etch in those areas, meaning more nitric acid to, to the etch ratio. Um, also things to keep in mind, the drawing materials used and the type of stone that I have. So this is kind of like a yellow gray stone. And so I'm going to go probably with this one. You might be able to think classify it as a gray stone, but I think it's probably closer to a yellow gray stone. So we need to determine that. And I'm using a general etch 
table. And um, there is a Kistler etch table. It's a little bit more complicated, but I kind of prefer this one actually to the, the more complicated one. Um, <clears throat> let's see, so I'm gonna be using this table right here, this column, and then I'm gonna look over here at my drawing materials. And I just have to kind of figure out what materials I used. I used number fives, number threes, and number one crayons, litho crayons. And I used some tush dissolved in water. I also used some rubbing crayon. Uh, but for the most part, so let's say I did a lot of number three in here. There's a lot of rubbing crayon. You know, it's all kind of overlapping each other, lots of scraping. So where there's scraping, there's residual grease that I have to burn out with a hot etch. Um, this stuff is all probably number three and rubbing crayon. I've got number one crayons in here. Um, this is probably all number two crayon throughout here, lots of scraping. So I'm just going to kind of go with kind of like a standard etch for me, which I'm going to do like a, med a light etch. Let's see what a light etch. So number three with medium. I don't really, this stone doesn't have a lot of delicate passages, but if I had a lot of delicate passages, I would want to be much more careful. Um, so I'm going to go with something around seven. I usually do, like if you look here, a six, a 10, and a 14, and that's a pretty reserved etch strengths. Um, a lot of people go a lot hotter, and there's times when I do want to go a lot hotter, but I tend to do a light etch that's around six, and then a medium, so like say six to eight. It could be even four to six for a light, depending on if I have really delicate stuff. Um, and then my medium is going to be like 8 to 10. And then my hot etches are probably not usually 14. I would say probably 16 to, to 18. Rarely do I go above 18 with my etches. You can see the hottest is like 20 here, 25, 20, 25 over here with the heavy materials with a gray stone. Um, but with a yellow stone, you know, the etches are slightly weaker. Um, that is not to say that it's not important to really consider this. What you need to consider is how delicate is your work um, and how dark is your work. My work tends to be fairly aggressive and there's a lot of marks. I'm heavy handed with my drawing. I do a lot of revision on the stone. I don't usually know what I'm going to draw until I start drawing. So I erase a lot. And so that's just kind of what I have to live with. So, but if I was doing something much, much more delicate, say with very delicate tush washes and delicate crayon work in here, I want to be careful that my etch is not too strong. If the etch is too strong, then I will burn out those delicate areas. Easily burn them out. Uh, if my etch is too weak in areas where it's got a lot of, uh, drawing material there, then those areas are most likely going to fill in, meaning they're going to go darker. So there's a tendency for your imagery, for the lights to want to go lighter, especially if they're, if the etch is too hot, and for my darks to want to go darker. Um, if I have a dark area, you know, I'm, I'm going to be able to hit it with a pretty strong acid and, um, and, and it, it should be a stable image. Now, there's a lot of things that we can do in the meantime to let us know if our etch is too hot. Um, if I apply an etch in a weak area, a, a strong, like a medium etch in a very delicate area, I might see frothing, like a frosty frothing of the etch r occur very quickly. And that would mean that the etch is too strong and it's overpowering the grease content and it's going to burn away my delicates. So I want to hit that with some straight gum Arabic very quickly if I can. Now, on the other hand, I do want to see some bubbling action. That CO2 is being released because of the chemical reaction that's happening on the stone. And so I want to see a little bit of bubbling over time. Um, so, okay, I'm going to take one more look at this. Let's see, my light areas. I don't have a lot of light areas, but I do have a lot of residual grease in some of these areas too. So I'm going to go with 
I'm gonna pretend most of my drawing was done with a number three light. So three to seven here. Um, I'll split the difference and do it a five, a five drop etch now for my weakest. And I can always cut that with gum arabic. Now for my medium etch, that would be areas more like here, 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 maybe, and here. Um, let's see. Let's compare what a number two. So medium 10 and a heavy is like 12. So 10, see, look right there. I'm going back to those same numbers, the five close to six. You know, I'm thinking a number, a, a 10 drop etch for my medium. And then my tush wash, I didn't really have any. I've got a lot of drawing material in here that's pretty heavy. So let's just say a number one with heavy drawing, 16. I didn't really do any tush wash in it that's really dark. Um, and I did have some rubbing crayon, so 20. So let's just say, um, let's just go with, yeah, I think we should just go with a 16 and that'll be okay. I can reapply that 16 drop etch in some of these darker areas and I'm confident that that will actually etch well. Now, I'm actually looking for some of these areas to fill in because I kind of want to go in with acid tinting during my second etch or while I'm printing so that I want to burn out some of these areas in the smoke and make it kind of more fluffy, rolly kind of smoke effect. And so I want this to kind of fill in a little bit. So if, if it's a little bit on the weak side, that's a good thing for me. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay. So let's mix our etches. We'll do a five drop, a 10 drop and a 15. Now that means per one ounce of gum, drops of nitric per ounce of gum. So this means what, what these numbers are is drops of acid per ounce of gum. So let's start by, we don't need our gloves yet and we'll want to have some goggles. You'll want to wear an apron. So something for your hands, something for your eyes. We've got our nitric acid. This is the one ounce measure. I'm going to take some gum arabic out of here. Now this is where things differ quite a bit in terms of how you etch. I've never seen two people etch their stones the same way. Um, I know that I'm cutting corners the way that I'm doing it. Um, and part of that is just because I tend to do things just the way that, that I was taught to do them. Um, but I'm also, I've never had any issues with the way that I do it either. So, I mean, I have had times where I've miscalculated my edge strength, but it's never ended with anything, you know, bad happening. Now, when I pour my gum arabic, I want it right up to the very top here. If this was a larger stone, Instead of using one ounce of gum arabic, I might need to use two ounces. So I would double all of my measurements. Now, once again, okay, so I started to talk about how the, all these, pr all printmakers tend to do some things differently. Okay, so the way that I'm gonna show you how to etch is basically about as easy as it gets. Um, I can complicate things though. So, what a traditional, a traditional method would be for me to rosin and talc my stone and to take a gum, fresh gum and put a layer on the entire surface and buff it down with cheesecloth. And then once I've done that, then I would apply my um, etches. So my, do like a weak etch over the entire surface and then I would buff that down. And then I would do spot etches from there. So I would take my medium etch and apply the medium etch in certain areas where, I, where it's appropriate and then do my hot etches. But that requires me using more gum arabic than I need to use and also um, I'm using a lot of cheesecloth because I'm buffing it down essentially twice and then um, um, a third time at the end. So I tend to want to kind of just do it all at once. And 
if I had a very delicate image, maybe I would do this differently and I would instruct people to do this differently. But with an image like this where it's all kind of dark and I don't have to be very careful that like a hot etch doesn't accidentally get into a very delicate area, I'm gonna kind of treat this a little bit more liberally. Okay, so I haven't mixed my etches yet. Just wiping that up. I'm gonna take my goggles and put on my gloves. Now this is nitric acid, this is pure nitric acid, so I wanna be very careful with this. Kinda of wanna sit down for this. Okay, this is an old glass dropper and you want to be careful when you're touching this. I don't really even want to handle this without gloves on. And um, the way that this used to work is this nozzle, you can see the little point on it. Yeah, even now it's kind of funky. Now that should line up, this should line up with that and it would allow ink to pass through very carefully, or uh, acid to pass through very carefully. I'm being very careful. I might actually want to use um, smaller gloves. This is all that I've got available right now. So I'm kind of doing this just for show. Um, I'm going to carefully pull some acid in my dropper. Now this glass bottle, it does not allow me to drop accurate amounts of acid in my in my etch solutions. So I've started using these droppers and it seems to be more accurate. It would just kind of pour out of this dropper bottle. Okay, so I'm gonna do my weakest etch first and I usually keep my weakest on the left to right. So going weakest to strongest. So I'll do, and that allows me if I mess up and I do too many drops, that can now be my stronger etch. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Come over here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. And then I just want to carefully, I don't want to drop any, you know, drops of this. I'm just carefully putting the nitric acid back in the container. I don't want to squirt this in very quickly. You know, I want to be very careful with that. And um, once I've done that, we're going to put this away immediately, okay? I really don't want this out while I'm etching, okay? So I'm going to turn this off for a second. I'll be right Okay, so um, now that that's done, you notice I put the dropper in here. I'll just fill this dropper up with water and kind of squirt it out a few times just to rinse out the dropper so that it's, you know, it doesn't have that residual nitric acid in there. Um, that nitric acid is straight nitric acid. I think it's 70% nitric acid. So, um, okay, so here's another thing. The etch strengths with... Um, you know, like I keep saying, I'm doing this the kind of the easiest way that you can. Now, gum arabic has a different, uh, a different pH. So my uh, gum arabic might increase in pH over time, um, and my etch strength it might affect my etch strengths. Some people can get very, very complicated with how they're dealing with their etch strengths. And I don't blame them. It's a very interesting um, aspect of this process. Um, so they would actually test with acid uh, test strips and pH strips and test each one of these etches to get it to the, the pH that they really want for this. Um, I'm not gonna go that far. It's not something that I'm that interested in. You know, it's my interest is in, I love, the process, but my interest is not so much in the chemical aspects of what's happening. Um, I just kind of know that this works and it works reliably for me. So I'm not going to 
break, you know, fix something that's not broken, okay? Um, but I would recommend if you're interested in that th type of work to go ahead and um, look into that a little bit more. There's a Instagram artist who, who uh, is called Mixed Grit and he does these great lithography demos where that he uh, tests each etch strength. He uh, creates a, a really, really elaborate system of measuring how he's going to etch his prints. He draws everything out, knows exactly where each etch is going to go. Like I said, that's for some people, it's not for me. So, not that I don't enjoy watching him do it though. Okay, so I've got some gum arabic. I've got my etches mixed. I'm going to keep this handy nearby. And now I'm going to apply my rosin and talc. So each one of these stations has a rosin box and a, and a talc box. My image is ready to go and I'm going to rosin first and I just want to put a small amount, I don't want a ton of it on here and um, you know I just want to lightly dust all of my image area with the rosin. Now rosin is um, very strong so it's it's it will resist the corrosive effects of the nitric acid. And actually it helps the drawing material, the grease content that's in your drawing material, it will cling to the greasy stuff on your stone and it'll actually dry it slightly and it'll bond to it and it'll help it resist the nitric acid, the corrosive effects of the nitric acid. So we want the nitric acid to um, release the fats from the grease from the drawing material but we don't want it to damage and overpower the drawing material either so that's what this does the rosin protects the image from the corrosive effects of the nitric acid now this is french talc and i'm going to do the same thing right after uh you could argue that doing rosin is fr do do your rosin first and do your talc second. Now, if you forget this step, which I have and pretty much every printmaker has at some point, um, don't panic because it's not going to cause a loss of image. Might lo lose a little quality of the image, but you know it's not going to be the end of the world. Now, the the talc, I did the same thing. I just want to kind of dust it off. I don't really want to get any of that rosin up in the air, so I want to use it sparingly because I don't want to inhale it, especially the rosin. Well, talc, talc also, I don't want to inhale talcum. Um, so, okay, we use the talc. The talc is more for the non-image areas than the image areas. So the rosin is, is useful in the image area. The talc is useful in the non-image areas and that and also the image areas. The talc allows me to apply my etches directly in certain spaces and so it doesn't bead up because grease it's and we have an aqueous solution that is going to want to bead up so the ink is going to be rejecting my etch solution and it won't want to like if i put it in one specific spot it'll stay there without the talc if i put it in one specific spot like that it'll want to bead up and kind of go into like a a beaded drop Okay, so this allows the etch to get into the entire image. Okay, now my image doesn't have a gum border. I usually do a gum border after um, because sometimes I like to break the edge like that. And sometimes I'll sand um, the edges, but I just wanna let you know that first. Okay, so I'm gonna kinda go ahead and speed things up now. This, my etch solution, I like to have it applied on my image um, pretty thick. So I really want to kind of pull it on. I've seen some people use a foam brush and just barely apply any etch solution. I just like to kind of go in and get some gum arabic down there. And I can actually already see some bubbling. So this might be too hot in some of these areas, but I'm not too worried about it because I want those areas to be a little bit whiter. And there's a lot of scraping that has occurred. Okay, so I'm gonna do this bus section. 
Now these figures are actually probably a little bit more delicate, the little faces in the bus. I actually didn't really do much work on them. This whole section back here is fairly delicate. I didn't do a ton of overwork in those sections. So you can see how I'm just kind of going for it. I know where I want this for the most part. All right, along here. And what I'm looking for, you can see some of this bubbling that's happening. So that's, um, you know, that's telling me that maybe that's a little bit too hot for this area right there, this, the five drops. Um, so there's a lot of bubbling, a lot of chemical reaction happening. I'm not that worried about it because I kind of want that spot white anyway. Um, but if it was in an area like this, let's see what happens when we do that. Now, if I saw very fast bubbling in those areas, that would be a concern. And I would just immediately reach over, grab this, and cut that with a little bit of just straight gum arabic. And that'll help to eliminate the, the edge from being too hot. Now, because I do have a lot of scraping in here, I don't mind if it's a little bit hot and, because I need that hot etch to kind of pull out some of the residual grease that's stuck in the pores. Okay, I'll just do this section right here too. And I might, I'm gonna hit this section probably with a medium etch as well. Um, and you can reapply it, your etch. So you don't want it to dry, you wanna kinda of keep reapplying it. And that should be good. Now you might be asking why I'm not doing the outside borders. I'm gonna kinda of wait and use my hotter etch for that. Now I can take the same brush and bring it over to my medium. Now I'm gonna leave this here cause I know that that's my weakest, middle, and hottest. That way I don't mix them up. Stir this up really well. And I'm gonna go in my medium areas here. Now this was actually drawn in just a couple minutes ago and I did some scraping in there. That little plane. Do some medium in here. This house is pretty much a good medium etch. These wheels have had some editing done. There's been some scraping in all of these areas essentially. So this medium etch is probably good for essentially all of this material. I'm gonna wanna watch that, see what's happening there. I don't know if you can see that or not. That's bubbling pretty quickly. You can see a lot of bubbles in here now, so I wanna kinda back that off a little bit. And I'm gonna keep going. I wanna keep my eyes on this section right there. Now the, the, um, the nitric in these etches will spin themselves out. Yeah, you can see there's still a lot of bubbling in there. I want to be careful with with this too. And this. So yeah, I'm just using this. So you can see how my approach is. I'm much more like, okay, if I see too much chemical action happening, then I need to back off. And and that's easy to do by just adding in some straight gum arabic. But it's good for me, because I do a lot of revision, it's good for me to have an etch that's slightly stronger than I want, because then it'll remove that residual grease that's still in the grooves from scraping.
and it'll just help prevent filling in later. So we're almost done here. Now this is all mostly number two crayon. And I can kind of move this around now. Okay, I'm gonna switch to my hot etch. So you can see now the only thing that's left is the the strongest. And you understand why I would go from hot to to weak. Now this also has a lot of revision, so I'm kind of expecting this to go a little bit frothy early and which would be good and then I can hit it with a little bit of gum arabic. Here's my dark areas up here and here Add a little bit in here, and I'll probably have to hit that. Yep, I could see it starting to, to froth up. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and do my border. A nice hot etch is good for your borders because it'll remove any of that grease that might be there from, you know, handling the stone. Maybe you've leaned on the stone. Maybe there was some drawing there that you removed with snake slip or sandpaper. So that's good. And I'm gonna touch up that middle, this section just again with a little bit of hot. Well, not hot, this is the my medium edge. All throughout there, looking for a few other areas that, you know, that medium edge is good. Okay. Okay, so in the meantime, I'm gonna let that sit. You, wa you want this whole process to last between 10, 15 minutes. Um, you know, but I want my last etch to have a little bit of time on the stone before I wipe it off. So now I'm gonna get my cheesecloth prepped. And I want at least three pads, you know, depending on the size of the pads and the size of your stone. But I'm just gonna take some pads, find a clean spot, start pulling in all of my corners to make a nice pad okay and I want at least three of those I usually do four just in case even when they get pretty hold holy you know they're still very useful just two oops pull in my corners you know, that this you wanna actually be very careful about. It. Like sometimes people just kind of like will take some cheesecloth and ball it up like this. And that's not good with all this like is gonna be dragging on your stone and causing little streaks. We wanna actually take we we do everything in lithography with care. There's really not a lot of times except maybe making the image where you're just kind of um, experimenting or um, you know playing around with materials and stuff so I'm gonna get these out of the way because I'm gonna be buffing and I don't want to knock any of these over so I'm gonna just go ahead and use my hand and just massage the rest of this down I want to be careful not to get too much gum arabic 
going off the stone. I really, but I do want to cover all the edges of the stone right here. I don't want to have it drip underneath the stone if I can, if I can prevent that because when gum arabic gets underneath your stone and it dries, it'll basically glue it to the press bed or whatever surface you're working on. So, okay, I've got that all over. I'm going to do an initial wipe around the edges and just kind of pull up some of the excess here. And then that goes right in my bowl of water. And now I want big circles. And you can kind of tell when it's not removing anymore. Okay, that goes in there too. Move to my next one. Faster, smaller circles. I'm buffing that gum layer down. And it's moving without catching on my drawing. So that gum is dry. So that's good. I didn't need this last one, but you know, it's nice to have it because I don't want to have to reach over and uh, get a fresh one. So you can see some of that gum arabic, you know, going into my image or onto my, under my stone. At this point, I don't want to get any water on my stone at all. I want to be very careful that the surface doesn't get any water. That could actually be very bad when I go to do my second etch. So I'm going to take this, not touching the surface at all. Go underneath it if I can. Going along the bottom, but not on the surface. And I want my hands to be kind of dry. And I can tip, because this is a small stone, I can kind of tip it up and inspect it. I want to be careful though because it's still a little bit slippery. And I'm going to move this to this press bed just overnight. And I'm going to leave one corner just hanging off in case it gets glued. Okay. Oh, wow. Forgot my glasses on. Okay. Now, now I'm just going to be cleaning up. So I'm going to want to come back with a clean sponge, wipe down this whole surface if I can. Um, I'm going to leave this. I'm going to leave this also because I know in class tomorrow we will be doing some more etching. Um, if you have a container for spent gum arabic for borders, you can do that. Ours is actually full at the moment and we rarely ever use it. So all this is going in here and I would put all my materials away, put my etch table away, put my tarlet, my cheesecloth away. And I just want to wa show you how to properly wash your cheesecloth. So everything's in the bowl, rinse everything out. And as everything is kind of soaking, you know, the, I would probably do all these little dishes and brushes first. You don't need soap or anything. You can just use water, but the cheesecloth is what I want to take care of the most. And I just like to spread these out, kind of let them go underneath the faucet like this. And I want to get all that gum arabic out of them. All the edges, especially. Keep them kind of moving. You, you'll be able to see like the brown of the gum arabic is gone, the amber color of the gum arabic. And then once I'm done, I'm gonna tighten these up. Now, one thing I did forget, like with litho, you're never using hot water. You're always using cold water. You don't really, and we just want to get in the habit of that because you can use warm water for cleanup, but you really would just want cold water. You want your stone, the water that you're using to sponge your stone to be cold, okay? 
Um, so now I have it. If I hung this up like that, all these little bits and pieces would all dry and they would be hardened. They would be like, you know, little hard bits. I want to snap my cheesecloth out and drop them like that and just lay them out over here, you know, wherever you can. Um, because if, if we didn't, then we'd have like little sharp edges. And when we went to buff down our, our stone, some of those sharp edges might cause little irregularities. Now, one thing about that stone also, you may notice when you're buffing your stone that some of the crayon may have come up and is on the the cheesecloth and you might be thinking wow well, like maybe am i removing the 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 grease no you're not the grease has already been um been kind of embedded into the stone it, you're just removing some of the pigment right so that nitric acid is going to you know affect the drawing material a little bit and the friction of wiping it is going to pull some off but it's not like you're taking it away it's still there it's just like in the in the stone now so don't worry about that okay and that's it i'll talk to you next time